This is our youth day, and we're so, just so glad every time the young, uh, the young choir sings, such innocent, precious voices singing and praising God. And we thank the Lord as well for the dancers as well, for the marvelous uh, ministry of dance. don't have to justify why we dance. Did you dance when you were lost? <laughs> yes, you did. I know you did. I told the people on Friday, I tried to dance when I was lost. I, I couldn't get it. I, just, I, I, I was just as stiff as a board. But when Jesus saved me, he gave me a rhythm. I can dance now. I've got something to dance about. And, and I'm, I'm just so thrilled, so thrilled. No, we don't have to justify dancing in the house of God. The trees wave and worship God. The moon and the stars worship God. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. So if you've got some limbs, you've got some hands, raise them to the glory of God. Give him praise. Give him thanks. Worship, worship in your way, your way. But whatever you do, worship. And uh, we, we're just so, just so grateful again for a man of Bible and the precious saints of God uh, out today. And those of you who are visiting with us, we really appreciate you being here with us. We have a few things we want to share with you a little later. But we've been working our way through 1 Corinthians. And we're in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And I, I remember as a... As a young lad, um, kid, boy, dad calls me, so I'll call myself a boy. I remember years ago, I was a young boy growing up and was fascinated, still am, fascinated by science fiction. And the, one, one of the series that, that um, I, I, I was just so immersed in was Star Trek. Um, Captain Kirk and, and um, Spock, the pointed ears and uh, the, the Enterprise. And, and the, the, the statement is that they're going where no man has gone before. And you see the, the Enterprise sort of shooting through the universe. And it warp speed, they call it. And I, I was just so impressed with the... the uh, I guess the creativity, I think it was Roddenberry who was the producer and the writer of, the, of the, that series. But uh, anyway, I remember one particular um, time when I was watching Star Trek, Captain Kirk, Spock, and um, the other engineer, I forgot his name, Scotty. <laughs> Amen. How could I forget Scotty? Amen. As, as, as was the case, they, they often found themselves in trouble. And, and uh, it was the Klingons in this particular episode. And I remember the Klingons were having their way with uh, Captain Kirk and the, the crew of the Enterprise. And they were, they were shooting, uh, I guess, these laser beams and, and just just almost decimating the enterprise. And then they went down on this planet trying to get away. Um, and, and there they were on the planet and the Klingons followed them there. And they were shooting their uh, light rays at them. And it, it was just, it was just, for my age, I was just so excited to see. I, I, I um, just, just really appreciated again the the idea of good winning out. And so I followed the series. I followed it uh, religiously. But uh, this, this particular time, and, and quite often when they would get in trouble, they would hit their, their, their breasts right there. And they, they would hit this, this equipment right there on their chest. Or, or in some episodes, Captain Kirk would say, beam me up, Scotty. 
And in the nick of time, they were transported from, from the planet back to the Enterprise. And it was just amazing. Again, as a young, young boy, I was just amazed by the, the idea that somebody could be transported from one place to another place instantaneously. And they captured, they captured that idea. And it, it, in fact, that same concept is, has made its way into other movies. Uh, I think the movie called Jump, where a man is able to move from one place to another. Uh, just, just a number of uh, movies have bought into this, this idea of, of transport. And in fact, in science, uh, I think it was, um, if I remember correctly, um, his name was Kimball, Dr. Kimball. He's a, a quantum physicist. And the question was asked, what's wrong with the idea of transporting humans from one place to another? And he says, it's simple. It can't be done. <laughs> That's what's wrong with it. He says the only, only kind of quantum transportation that can happen is on computers. But to transport bodies, people, matter from one place to another is impossible for humans to accomplish. Well, the, the, the marvel is, is that Jesus has mastered the, the concept of quantum transportation. The scripture says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13, that the Lord himself will come with the shout of the trumpet of God, the dead will be raised, and we who are alive shall be transported to meet him in the air. This, this is, is this, this concept of what we call the rapture. And no humans can't do it, but Jesus Christ, the living Lord, has the ability to transport us. And in fact, that leads right into my... my uh, my text here, when the Apostle Paul says, by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all shall be made alive. And I shared last week with you about this idea of intimate synergy, that we are in Christ. Scripture says, in Christ, all will be made alive. And so, because we're in Christ, the tyranny of sin's penalty will not affect us. We're not concerned about facing condemnation from God. Not only is the penalty of sin taken care of for those that are in Christ, but also the power of sin, the tyranny of, of sin in the life. The believer's life can be conquered. There's no reason for believers to live subpar lives because we've been set free from the tyranny of sin's power. Amen. And Christ has set us free. And the scripture says, so we shouldn't entangle ourselves again in the yoke of bondage. We've been set free from the power of sin. Prior to coming to Christ, we were um, depraved. We, we, we had no capacity to live right. And it took the miraculous power of God to save us and to quicken us, to bring life from the dead. So today, today, because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we no longer are facing the tyranny of the penalty of sin. We no longer are facing the tyranny of the power of sin. And last, we're no longer facing uh, the, the tyranny of sin's presence forever. That uh, one day we will be removed from the presence of sin, from the tyranny of, of living in, being exposed to sin. 
Christ will set us free one day uh, by way of what the scripture calls the, well, we, we use the term rapture. The actual word rapture is not in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. It's, it's the word harpazo. And the word harpazo, in fact, we get our word uh, harpoon, our Greek, uh, English word harpoon from that Greek word. And to harpoon something is to shoot a, a, um, a sharp, sharp sword. And then whatever it gets yes. pierces, yes. you reel it in. You actually, in fact, the word means to snatch. That's the literal meaning of harpazo. And so when Jesus comes in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, he will snatch us out of this world. And we will exit the tyranny of sin's presence. I want you to know that I believe in a literal rapture. And there are those, again, who teach that it's not literal, but that it is um, more of a figurative um, expression of what Christ is going to do in the future. But I, I see literal transportation out of this world that uh, what the text says is that Jesus Christ we will meet him in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. So the tyranny of sin will, will be conquered when we um, are snatched out of this world. And there are two areas where sin predominates as far as you and I are concerned. It's out there. It's everywhere. In, it's in the world. It's all around us. You, you can't miss it. It's, it's in your, um, your neighborhood, it's in your home, it's in, it's in the community, it's, in, it's at work, every, everywhere you go, um, simply because the Adam, Adam's nature is in people. So wherever people are, sin is present. And so sin has made its, its indelible mark in this world. But there's a promise that we have an earnest expectation, in fact, that we have that one day we will be removed from the presence of sin. But then there, there is also another area, and that's in us. That there is this struggle, and, and I'm speaking right now to believers. Non-believers don't have a struggle relative to sin. They're, they're in Adam they, they're not cognizant, they're not sensitive to the Spirit of God. They're, they don't have the Spirit of God in them. Now, they might live a, what we call an upright life, but they're not living a holy life. To live a holy life, it requires the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit living in us. And according to the Word of God, when the Spirit of God comes in, and I would refer you to it, but um, there in Romans chapter 7, uh, the Apostle Paul said that when I would do good, evil is always present. That which I want to do right, I don't do, Paul says. And that which I hate doing, I do. And there's this, this, this perpetual struggle that we're going, as, going, in, going through as long as we're in this world. There is, there is this, this ball and chain of the flesh that ties us down wherein we would live good, holy lives and, and, and sinless. But the, the sin, the, sin uh, the presence of sin in the flesh hinders us from living perfect lives. It's a ball and chain that, that uh, we're going to be delivered from. And it's a huge struggle in, in the life of the believer. It's a struggle that um, is inescapable. The moment you receive Christ, it, it begins. You, 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 your, your tendency to, to uh, live for Christ is going to be resisted. In fact, Paul said in Galatians that the Flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the, the flesh. These two are contrary. There, there's, a, there's a battle going on within your soul. 
if you're a believer. And the Apostle Paul said in Romans 7, as, as he's working his way through the, the awareness of, of this, this struggle, this perpetual struggle, and, and I really appreciate Paul's statement because he, he called himself in Romans 7. I'm not going to turn you there um, just yet, but, but I, I, I'm just amazed at, at the expression. He, he called himself a wretch. He, he looked at this, this, this struggle, this perpetual struggle against sin, and, and he hated it. He despised the, 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 the flesh that betrayed his spirit. He despised it. And beloved, you and I need to be there if, if, we're, if we're living for Jesus Christ. If you're saved, you need to be so sensitive to the Spirit of God that, that you hate that which separates you from him. Paul said, oh, wretched man. In fact, the, the one translation picks up the, the Greek word there and calls, translates it as miserable. I know what it is. I know what he means by that. To be miserable. To look at myself and, and see a miserable person when, when sin enters the life. And beloved, if that's not the case for you, and I would to God that you were there, I would to God that all of us would, would know the wretchedness of our, of our being. The closer you get to God, the more aware you are of your, your failures and your wretchedness. People that are drifting from God develop self-righteousness. They develop a sense of, of who they are. But people that are getting close to the fire of God's holiness, the Spirit of God pierces the darkness of our soul and points to the wretchedness of our spirits that are in our souls. And that, that just leads us to this place. Paul said, oh, wretched man that I am, <laughs> who will rescue me from the body of this death? I shared this with you. I, I don't know, maybe I'll share it again. But in, in Roman, in the, the Roman culture, they, they, uh, perfected capital punishment. No one could do capital punishment the way Romans could. They make you regret your, your, your crime. When they put Jesus on the cross, they, per, they, had, they perfected the crucifixion so that it was a slow, painful death. Well, another way that they uh, would, would um, punish criminals would kill someone what they would do would take the dead carcass the purpose the person you slayed and they would tie your your body to its body the, the corpse that you killed hand to hand foot to foot mouth to mouth and face to face and you're looking in the eye of the, the dead corpse you're carrying it around that's the figure of what Paul had. Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? And we're, we're carrying around a dead corpse, beloved. The stench of this dying and decaying corpse reeks within our spirits. It should be a sense of hatred of ourselves and that sin that, that resides in this, in this carnal flesh. We need to come to, to hate this, this body, <laughs> that, this flesh, the principle of flesh that resists the ways of God. And so it's tyranny. <laughs> I, I don't know a better way to say it than sin has a way of terrorizing. Yes. Yea, even believers. It, it exercises its tyranny over us, and it, it, it refuses to give us carte blanche. 
do what you want for God. The, the sin nature is saying no. It, it, it refuses. Paul said in Romans 8, the flesh is enmity toward God. And see, if, if you and I keep petting it, keep, keep uh, being, being sympathetic for the flesh, that flesh is going to turn and bite you. You, you. Paul said in Galatians, crucify the flesh. Said in Colossians, mortify the deeds of the body. Put it to death. It's a dead, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's destined for death, and yet we, we, we carried it around in, in a tyrannical exercise of its power over us. Sometimes we, we have eruptions of sin, and it, it's tyranny, beloved. Well, who shall deliver us? from the body of this death? Paul said in Romans 7, thanks be to God, we have victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have power from the, we have, we're, we're delivered from its penalty, sin's tyranny. We're, we're delivered from the tyranny of sin's power over us. There, we, we do have the ability to resist. And one day we're going to be delivered from the presence of sin. That's our, our earnest expectation. I want to take you to 1 John. Look at 1 John chapter 3 with me. 1 John chapter 3. In 1 John chapter 3, he discussed this, this idea. He talks about this idea in the context of enjoying the, the intimacy of being in, in Jesus Christ. Listen to these, these uh, precious words that John shares uh, with, with the believers. And see, this is, again, this is intimate synergy that he's expressing here in 1 John, that our, our, our spirits are linked one in Jesus. We're one with him. And John says in 1 John chapter 3, verse 1, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we, you and I, should be called children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are the children of God. And it does not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him is purifying himself, even as he is pure. This, this um, is... is is a powerful um, promise that we have from the Apostle John about this deliverance from the presence of sin. John calls the people of God beloved. We're, we're the beloved of God. I, I just love the, the tender expressions of intimacy and affection. Um, God's um, apostles express to you and I. We're, we're the beloved of God. He loves us dearly. And John wants us to behold it, to get a look at it, to take a, uh, an intense look at it. One, he calls us his children, you and I. John says it as if he's surprised that God would, would call us his children. Our entitlement, we have no entitlement to it apart from his grace, apart from his mercy and his favor, we're not entitled to being called the children of God. And I do, do want to clarify that, that everybody in this world is not a child of God. We're, we're, not, ch we're not children of God by way of birth. We're children of God by way of second birth. 
by way of new birth, by way of the second birth, by being born again. That's what makes us children of God. And he calls us the beloved of God. Now. Right now. So this, this is a, a present reality for us. Right now, I don't care what's happening with you. If you're in Christ, right now you are a child of God. Future, he says, it does not yet appear what we shall be. But right now, you're a child of God. In the future, there's a promise. But we don't know for sure what that's going to look like. We don't have specifics, but we do have a general understanding of what it. We know that when he appears, we'll be like him. Specifically, don't know what, it, what it's going to be like to be in a glorified body. But generally speaking, we know we're going to be like him. And, and so Paul says here that it's a perfect hope. In fact, he says, we know. That's, that's a perfect tense, and a perfect tense is completed action. Our knowledge of this reality is perfect, and it reveals certainty that our hope in Jesus Christ, our deliverance from this earth, from its tyranny, is certain. It's going to happen, beloved. I was reading, um, 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 I forgot the author, but um, the three views of the, the rapture. One, um, one group thinks that the rapture is going to happen after uh, the millennium. Another thinks it's going to happen in the millennium, or tribulation, forgive me, after the trip, at the end of the tribulation. Another group thinks it's going to happen in the middle of the tribulation. And you and I, we believe that it's going to happen before the tribulation. Well, I, I just want to say, before during or after what is certain we're, we're leaving this place beloved <laughs> it is certain we know that when he is revealed we shall be like him and we shall see him as he is it's a perfect hope it's a perfect hope and uh, perfect hope the, the perfect tense it's completed action with ongoing results that our hope is, is so certain that we are, think about it, our songs express this hope. The, the, the ongoing expectation, the earnest expectation of our hope that one day Christ will come and get us, it, it's ongoing every day. Could this be the day? It's enthusiastic hope. It's a energetic hope. It's perpetual. We know this. Not only is it a perfect hope, but it's a powerful hope. Look at the text again. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him. Now somewhere between when he is revealed and when we're like him, something happens. There is a transformation that takes place. Paul called these bodies vile. That's another term, wretched, vile bodies. They shall be made like unto his body. Our, our bodies are vile, but they're going to go through a huge, tremendous, and powerful transformation. In fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the Apostle Paul says, I show you a mystery. We not, shall not all sleep, but we all shall be changed. For in the moment of twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, the dead in Christ will rise, and we shall be changed. By the power of God, it's a powerful change that God is going to change these, these sinful bodies, these sin-cursed bodies, and make them like his body. It's a powerful, powerful. It's, it's like, it's like um, um, Captain Kirk on an island hitting his breast and saying, beam me up. And I, you know, beloved, I, I, you know, there have been times if, if I had one of those things, I would have hit it. I would have hit it. I would have worn it out. Beam me up. And, and, and you know, some, some, sometimes it's, it's what, what's happening to me from out there 
But a lot of times it's, ha it's what's happening in me, from inside me. I get so tired of me, me. You know, God, I, I want this change. I, I, I want it so badly. I want to be like him. I want to be free of this, this burden of this, this carnality, this, this carnal flesh. I want to be free of the tyranny of sin's presence. I want to be away from it. And look at the text. We shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Hallelujah. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. Not only is it a perfect hope, it's a powerful hope, but it's a purifying hope. It's a hope, beloved. It's an expectation. It's, it's, it's a certain expectation. And, and John says, if this is your hope, you're going to be purifying yourself. And, and the reason why? Because if you're expecting Jesus, you don't want to be caught dirty. I, I, don't, I, I know I've told you the story of being at home, 606 Lenard Street, and rooms weren't clean. Michael's room, special. <laughs> oh, I'm just gonna let it out. I love my big brother, man. I, I, I love him. I love him. I don't have anybody else. Bob's room, my room, we, 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 we just had a mess, but mom and dad, mom and dad said, look, clean it. And it better be clean when we get home. And wouldn't you know it? We, we, we watched television, ran around outside. He didn't know. But see, we, we, we were kicking back because we, we, were, we, were, playing the we were playing the clock, clock game. We, we knew after dad gets off, he's gonna pick mom up so he would be home by about 4.30, 5 o'clock. We were playing the clock game. We had it down, we had it down. And then we would rush to get it clean. A couple times, they came a little early. <laughs> And things weren't done. And, and you know, when, when Jesus comes, the time, the time to get ready, the time to get clean is not when he's, it's too late. If he cracks the sky, it's over. The time to get clean is now. The time to purify yourself is today. I'm trying to play the clock game with Jesus. Walk as children of light, not as children of darkness. See, his, his return is imminent as any moment. No man knows the hour or the, the day or the hour. So because of that, because of the imminency and the urgency of his, his return, every man who has this hope in him is purifying himself, which tells me this that if you're not purifying yourself, then you don't have this hope. Does that make sense? Makes sense. That therefore, there are a lot of folk who say they know and love Jesus, but they're not purifying their lives. They're not thinking about Jesus, Joseph, or Mary. They're not, it's not, God is not on their mind. And all you have to do is just watch that tree. Jesus said, you'll know a tree by its fruit. Yeah. Check out the fruit. Now, I know the fruit, is, you know, the sign on it says it's an orange, orange uh, a tree. You don't want apples coming off an orange tree. If you say you're a believer, then, you know, I, I, I expect to see some fruit. Yeah. All of us expect to see some fruit. Absolutely. We need to be purifying ourselves if, if, if this is our hope. Every, and, and, and the whole idea here, in fact, the, the uh, verb there, purify, in fact, it's intensified. He purifies himself. 
And, and I, I know sometimes I prayed, God, make me clean. God, wash me. And you know, God has provided all of, all of what we need to be washed. We need to take the active step to clean ourselves. God's not going to do for you what you can do for yourself. Get up, go to the shower, and clean yourself. He's not, he's not going to clean you for you. He has put the word of God, the spirit of God in you. He has put the word of God at your access. Now get in the book. Jesus said you are clean through the word which I have spoken. Hence, that's exactly why so many so-called believers are not clean. Why? They're not in the book. The book will clean you. This book will keep you away from sin or sin will keep you away from the book. It's one way or the other. So what are you, what are you reading? What, what, what did you read this week? Was, was, it, was it Genesis, Exodus, Numbers, Deuteronomy? What, what, Old Testament, New Testament? Were you in the book this week? See, if, if you weren't in the book this week, you know what that tells me? You've got dirt on you. That's the truth. And, and you know what? If, if you take a big whiff, you can smell it. Oh, you know it. You know it. You, you, you know you're dirty. You know it. You don't need anybody coming up on you to tell you that. See, the book, <laughs> the book is, is the, the purification God has made accessible for us to, to wash ourselves, cleanse ourselves. How shall a young man cleanse his way? By what? Taking heed to thy word. We're clean by way of the word of God. We're washed by the word of God, beloved. And so it's a perfect hope. It's a powerful hope. It's a purifying hope. I wanted to ask our uh, young folk. I wanted to ask, because this, this uh, Paul's um, exhortation here is, is about expectation, anticipation. It's about enthusiastic, um, enthusiastically looking forward to and awaiting um, it's, it's, it's this eager sense of our emancipation we, we know it's coming and I, I, I just want to challenge our young people today what honestly and, and you don't have to answer but really what is your hope what is your hope um, precious children of God what is your hope I mean, let, let, t take away all the, the frills. And I, I know, you know, if you're young, um, what, 14, 15, you, you know, you're looking forward to life and whatever that entails. Uh, you're, looking, you're looking forward to um, perhaps driving. You're looking forward to perhaps uh, maybe somewhere along the line picking up a, a, a boyfriend or girlfriend. Isn't that expectation? Oh, don't go silent on me. Come on now. <laughs> Come on now. You're, you're expecting one day you're to, to get into relationships. And, and beloved young, young folk, and I'm talking to our teens, um, I, I, I want so badly for you to, to uh, so embrace Jesus and be set free from the tyranny of, of sin's power over your life. And I so want you to in, embrace Jesus Christ until the reality of your love for him exceeds every other expectation you have. That, that your boyfriend knows, I love Jesus. Your girlfriend knows, I love Jesus. Your, your schoolmates know, I love Jesus. A friend of mine years ago asked me, he said, David, how do you, how do you, how do you, how do you so freely share and talk about Jesus Christ? I said, what, what helps me is when, when I, when I, when I meet people, 
it's the first thing I, I want to start talking about. It, 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 it's, it's, I, I want to get it out there because I want them to know from the get-go, as for me, it's Jesus. I, I don't even want them guessing about where my hope is. I don't want them wondering about what, what really motivates me, what really energy. I want them to know right up front, Jesus. And, and, and beloved, uh, precious young folk, let, 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 let the love of Jesus Christ get a hold of you. I, I tell you, I tell you, if you let him get your heart, you will look back. When you get 59 years old, you will look back on your life and you'll thank God. But I promise you this. You keep messing around and, 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 and putting Jesus off. You get to 59, you may not even think about Jesus. And if you do, you'll wonder, you, you'll, have, you'll be filled with regrets. See, this expectation, this, it's, it's a perfect hope. It'll purify your heart, it'll purify your, your hopes, your dreams. And you'll, you'll run, you'll run your, your earthly expectations through the grid of your heavenly expectations. See, you don't, you don't want to do something on the earth that's going to affect your heavenly perspective. That's, that's, that's powerful. That, that his, his, the hope of Jesus coming influences my day-to-day -day routines. It influences the, 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 the music I listen to. It, it, I, I mean, young folk, young folk, please stop putting garbage into your mind. Let, let the hip hop, let these guys, these rappers go because all they're doing is ruining your spirit and your soul. They're poisoning your mind. These guys call women out of their names and and what, what young lady, what young lady in her right mind wants to be called that? I'm, I'm twittering now. For Jesus. <laughs> I want you to know that right up front. It's, and, and, and I thank God, I thank God for my, my precious friend, uh, um, uh, Demo. He says, you, you know what, you, you can pastor more than people here at man. You can pastor hundreds and hundreds of people on Twitter. And I'm, 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 I'm Twittering the truth of the gospel in Jesus Christ. I had, I had a, a, a young, young lady, and I'm assuming she's alive. I, I don't know, you know, I mean, they, it looks like it on, on, on the computer, but you never know. But it appeared as if she was a young lady. And she says, she says um, don't, all, don't all young ladies want a bad boy? I, and, she, and she said, I, 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 don't, I don't want him doing bad things, but I like him being bad. <laughs> and I, I, I tweeted back to her. I, I said, you know what? There are a bunch of young ladies who are respectful, and they want to be, to be, they want to be res, uh, treated respectfully. So every, every young lady does not want a bad boy. There are a lot of godly young ladies that want some good men who don't, who don't curse them, who don't demean them, who don't disrespect them, who honor them, who, who protect their bodies, who are not, not looking to exploit them and take advantage of them. Not, not, not everybody's like that. And then, then I tweeted back Proverbs chapter 1 verse 7 that the, the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom but fools ignore instruction. You want a bad boy? You want a fool? Find, find, find a man that's, that's submissive to the word of God and he'll be a blessing to your soul. Bad boy. I, I know what it is, just, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's the mood, it's the, 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 the sway, the trend of, 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 of the culture imposing itself on our thinking. But, but it just shows you how, how debased our thinking is that we think bad is good. Ah, that, see, that's the Adamic nature. 
Adam's nature has twisted, has, has really twisted truth. Yeah. It's all twisted up, beloved. Yeah. And, and, and you know what? You know what? Satan is the master of twisting truth. Started it in the garden, and he, he, somehow or another, he has perfected his craft. He's, he's, got, he's got this thing so twisted, he's got men thinking they can marry men. Yeah. What is that? That's twisted. Something's wrong with that thinking. Bad is good and good is bad. I, I tell you, you know what? I want to get out of this place. I'm, I, I'm ready. <laughs> I'm ready. So if you, if you, if you get a sense that, that uh, you, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of uh, 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 down and, and I'm not depressed. Because I'm looking for Jesus. I've got a hope. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and his righteousness. And I wouldn't dare trust the sweetest ring, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. I'm so tired of the tyranny of this place. But I'm, I'm, I'm just so encouraged as I'm reading going on in 1 Corinthians 15 that the Apostle Paul says, not, not, only, not only is the, the rapture going to take place, but, but one day Jesus Christ is going to come to this earth and set up his kingdom. Oh, marvelous God. Yes, you are. One, one, one day he's going he's gonna, to he's gonna get it all straight. He's going to make what is wrong right. He's going to make the crooked places straight. He's going to fix it. And I tell you, I, I'm, I'm just so revved up. I can't, I can't wait. And, and I, I'm not, I'm telling you, I'm telling you the honest to God, truth, God knows my heart. I thank God I'm alive, so I'm not looking for, um, you, you know, to die. That, that's, not the, the, that's not where I am. What I'm looking for is Jesus. I so want Jesus to change this place. I, I so want to see it happen. Habakkuk said that, that, that one day the glory of God will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. I can't wait until the knowledge of God is so, so pervasive throughout this, this world. Until, until you can go in, into, um, you know, we call it Mickey D's now. Until, until we get a Messiah burger. That's right. That's right. Be, 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 because, because now we can market the Messiah, the glory of his kingdom. Messiah genes. Oh, it's coming, beloved. I'm, I'm, I'm buying stock in that kingdom. It's coming. It's coming. I'm eagerly awaiting my transportation. <laughs> when I watched a movie the other day with uh, the, the president, somebody was trying to assassinate, not, not Obama, but it was in a the movie. They were trying to assassinate the president. They ushered him, they ushered him out into his limo. The limo, in fact, um, they, they, called for, they called for his limo because shots were being fired. And the limo just, just took off from where it was, down the street, speeding down the street, trying to get to where the president was. And then when it, it made this turn and came, and you hear the wheels screeching to pick up the president. But love it, we, we've, got, we've got a limo coming for us. <laughs> We, 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 we've got a, a, a dynamic limo coming for us. In fact, the scripture says the trumpet of God will sound. <laughs> and, and, and this limo, this limo can handle the dead and the living. Because the, the trumpet will sound, the dead will rise, we who are alive will be snatched up to meet him in the air. And Paul says, so shall we ever be with the Lord. And then, then he says in, in verse 18, comfort one another with these words. Beloved, I find great comfort in you, 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 you get down, you get down, you get down, read 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We got a limo coming. That ought, that ought to encourage you. That ought to inspire you to, to keep living for Jesus. Don't, don't get down. Help is on the way. Chariot is coming. <laughs>